much, Jay. That was um, amazing. I'm really, really honored. Um, no pressure. So I am a little bit nervous with this quiz, but hopefully you will have some uh, trainees here or people that just want to learn a little bit more, um, you know, like a poopery of ocular path. Um, so this, I think, yeah, you guys can see my mouse here. So let me just get it away from there. Um, so this presentation, it's going to be in a quiz format. Um, hopefully you guys will be able to, let me go okay, click in here. Okay. Uh, we're going to just keep repeating the cycle. I have gathered uh, 11 questions. The last two questions are bonus questions. And uh, hopefully the last two questions are going to be almost like a review of what we you guys were quizzed on. So hopefully at the end, you guys will be able to um, ace those two last um, questions and pictures. So they will always have a, uh, have a picture to go along. Uh, clinical and or histopath or even gross um, specimens. And then we'll discuss a little bit why the answer was that. And if you guys have any questions, you can put in the public chat. Um, and we're gonna go from there. We're gonna be using a poll system. So don't go ahead and put your answers in the chat. Just wait for the poll to be launched and then you can go for it. Uh, and this is more like a potpourri of, uh, you know, more foundations, basics, I know embryology, inflammatory, and neoplastic. So um, until you know, there are a couple more complex, a couple of interesting facts, and some of them are more basic. So, all right, let's go for it. So first question, I'm going to um, start a poll here. And you guys will be uh, already available or able to answer. So this is a histologic picture of a developing eye, so very, very primordials of an eyeball. Believe me, this, this is going to be an eyeball. So during maturation of the optic vesicles, which structure will be formed from this? Then I'll see if I, we can reach, uh, we are a 52 user, so we'll see if we can get at least uh, half that, which is great. We already kind of went through half of the folks. Let's see if we can get at least two. Uh, Let's see, 20 something. Okay, I think we have a really decent number. Um, all right, let's see how good your eye embryology is. So let me just publish this poll for now. Let's see, I think the public, uh, the public chat, okay, we can see the results. So we had, you know, most people here, 49% answering um, a, so cornea, followed by retina, and then lens, and then radio corneal angle. All right, that's interesting. So let's check the answer for this. All right, so very few people got this one right. Uh, so this little plaque code, or let me go here, because this is where am I? Let me get the, the pointer here. This, uh, um, you know, uh, pointed out this is this is what we call the lens plaque code so you guys can see that it is almost like a little plaque right with extra cells that are getting a little bit taller and they are just abutting what we call the optic vesicle so the optic vesicle um actually this one's already maturing to an optic cup uh if it has you know almost like a basically like a cup shape uh, and this is part of the embryology process uh, that actually, that's the step of optic cup formation will follow the uh, evagination of the optic vesicle. So optic vesicles are little out pouches that uh, will arise from that forebrain region in the developing embryo. Um, and there are two little, you know, kind of uh, uh, balloons coming out of the, of the, the fore region. Um, when those balloons, they come from the narrow ectoderm, when the notochord is being developed, et cetera, where the CNS is going to be formed, um, those little balloons will then uh, interact or talk, Chris, uh, you know, chit chat with the ectoderm that is on top of it. So the little vesicles are the ones that are going to uh, kind of fold on themselves, forming this cup shaped um, structure. And the crisscross talk here will, they're, you know, dependent on a bunch of mediators, a bunch of chemical sign signals, uh, they will stimulate the ectoderm 
to proliferate and differentiate into taller and more cells. And that's your lens placot that later on will start to invaginate along with the actual cup, kind of detached, detached from the ectoderm, where they're coming from, and then form the lens vesicle. Lens vesicle is really cool because it is uh, initially a hollow structure. And those guys, and that's also uh, the only period where the lens is circumferential, circumferentially lined by cells. Later on, the posterior aspect of this lens material, or lens, you know, incipient lens, um, they will elongate again and then follow or fill up this hollow structure, which will then be the lens, the actual lens as we know it. And they lose their posterior lining. So that's why posterior lens capsule does not contain lining epithelium. Uh, they were once there when the developing eye, but they're not there anymore because now they were elongated and they formed what in the adult or mature animal was going to be part of the nucleus. So you are born with or you die if you don't get your lens um, off or you don't have a fake lens, uh, you die with your embryonal cells that were pushed towards the nucleus. Um, and whatever is left of that epithelium is actually now going to be the corneal, the corneal uh, structure or most particularly the, cor the corneal epithelium. Here's another diagram to help, you know, just put this all together. So remember, the optic fascicles, which are the balloons coming out of the forebrain, will invaginate on themselves, forming the cup. The cup will actually, that cup will be uh, the primitive structures of the retina and a little bit of the anterior uterus as well. Uh, so just so you guys know, as an extra bonus, those cups in the inner uh, segment or the inner layer will be the neural retina as we know it. You know, all the beautiful layers of the retina. Uh, and then the outer layer will be the retina pigmented epithelium. Uh, so that's why they're always, you know, kind of best friends, um, always together. Um, those, the lens placot now is already differentiated and invaginating forming the lens vesicle. And then whatever's left behind will, uh, will be the corneal epithelium. So what we saw in that picture is, let me go back here, is the actual manifestation of the lens placot. So these guys will be the lens in the future. So a little bit of poopery of um, eye embryology. It is phenomenal. All right. Okay, let's keep going. Let me start a poll here. And start poll. All right, question number two. This is eye from a dog. This condition can be associated with a hypercalcemia. B, iridociliary tumors, C, immunosuppression, or D, sepsis. This is a, a little bit of more, it's a tricky one. It is a, It can be a tricky one. If you are a little bit off by it, it makes sense. All right, we still have 20 people left to answer we're getting there let's see if we can get you one digit one digit um person count here so we can stop the poll this one okay this one we have a lot of folks all over the place which is interesting um okay so we're stuck at 11 so probably 11 folks uh, did not respond but it's okay We'll have plenty of opportunities for other questions. So let's publish this poll. Okay, public chat. All right, so this is actually, if you guys are logging in after, I'm not sure if you guys can see the whole history of the chat, but this is the most recent polling, which is the third polling that's showing up here, even though it's question number two, because the first one is just a test. Uh, just so you guys keep track of all the polls. All right, so we had, okay, all over the place, which is very cool, very interesting. So majority answered hypercalcemia followed by immunosuppression and then iridociliary tumors. Oh, sorry, the, uh, the third option, the third most voted option was sepsis and the last one was iridociliary tumors. Okay, I already figured out this is gonna be a tough one uh, because it is a little 
it's a, a, a bit counterintuitive, but if you know if you know your your eye stuff, you're you're probably going to be, you know, kind of leaning towards one versus another. Um, so actually, this is a very interesting picture because this is a dog that underwent cataract surgery. Uh, they actually removed the lens, and so there's no lens here in this guy. And actually, this guy had a vitreous displacement. Um, so what we're seeing are the the actual change that I want you guys to see are, and I think most of you guys um, already identified, are the white speckling, right? The white spots, uh, kind of free floating, um, kind of free within this space, which is actually in the interior chamber in this case because of the whole context of this dog. So that's why it's a tricky question and it's a tough one. This is a, a quite complex one. Uh, so actually these little particles, they are not on top of the cornea, they are not plastered against the cornea. Uh, the cornea stroma is fairly transparent, fairly clear. Uh, they're actually inside of the chamber, just free floating in the chamber. And that's what we call um, asteroid hylosis. So asteroid hylosis um, resembles almost like a snowball uh, effect, right? So if you shake it, uh, you're going to see all the floating particles there. Uh, they are suspended particles in the vitreous. They start to form the vitreous because they're part of a degenerative process overall. And they are a accumulation or you know, transformation deposits of vitreous material with calcium and phospholipids. So you're going to have this precipitation of these two components mostly. They have other components too, but those are the big ones. Um, and they will just form this really cute, uh, you know, almost like, um, you know, little little aggregations, little concretions, quote unquote here. Uh, um, you know, the, these are our snowflakes of the eye, uh, but they are pretty pale basophilic, kind of amorphous, you know, almost like cotton candy type of texture. Um, and they have different diameters. Usually, you know, they are within that five to 20 micrometer diameter. Um, and they, again, they, form, they can form by incidental degeneration of the vitreous, you know, just by age-related degeneration over time. Um, but they can also be seen with, you know, they can be very rich and very prominent in animals with iridociliary neoplasms. So if we're talking about, oh, sorry, yeah, um, Dr. Kohler is putting here, yeah, putting here in the chat. I'm sorry, this is my fault. I should have uh, typed here, asteroid hylosis, as Dr. Kohler just mentioned here. Um, so these guys, regarding the iridociliary tumors, uh, they're not sure exactly why it has been this, you know, quote unquote association here. They can be pretty robust and pretty, pretty frequent with iridociliary tumors. So adenomas, carcinoma, adenomas most often, um, they think it might be a product secreted by the actual neoplastic cells that will, you know, either, I guess, accelerate the vitreous degeneration or it's something that precipitates, you know, chelates and precipitates inside of the vitreous. Um, so that's that's why, you know, there's this whole theory behind it. And the fun thing is they are biorefringent under polarized light. Um, so if you're having trouble, you know, sometimes they can be a little bit more kind of fimbriated than this or, you know, sometimes I have so much uh, plasmoid, you know, aqueous versus vitreous. Um, and they are all over the place and have aggregates of fibrin. You're still not sure if these are asteroid hylosis or not. You can polarize your eye. And if they polarize it, that's your guide. That's your asteroid hylosis. Uh, so remember that they form in the vitreous. In that case, it, it, it was a quote unquote tricky, you know, fluke picture because the vitreous was displaced anteriorly because of the lack of, um, of lens. So it was pretty interesting. I mean, it was following uh, uh, the cataract surgery. So it's pretty interesting. So that's our asteroid hylosis. And if you guys have questions, you can either save it towards the end or, you know, when I'm explaining each question, if you have, uh, or each question slash answer, if something is left unclear, feel free to put in the public chat. And if you cannot find where the public chat is, it's going to be on your, probably if you click on your icon, which is in the top left corner, uh, you're going to see the public chat um, tab in there. All right, this is one of my favorites. So let's start the polling for this one for now. Okay, question number three. This rabbit probably has or has a 
um, dysplastic pectinate ligament, leprid herpes virus, encephalozone infection, or a thymoma. All right, let's see. Let's see if we can get to the single digit digit um, response here, you know, leftovers of, of results. All right, we're at 13. Let's see, okay, 12. Let's see if we have a couple of more people. Just one more, one or two. Just go with your best. Okay, I guess we're stuck at 11. It's fine. All right, publish poll. Poll, poll. Okay, so we had, oh, nice, 60% of folks answering thymoma followed by encephalozone infection. Um, then just a couple of folks, um, you know, leprid herpes or dysplastic pectinate ligament, which would be, you know, uh, the part of uh, underlying kind of gonadogenesis type of thing. Um, okay, so this was a really good, good one, good turnaround. And yes, majority of you guys got it right. So this is, this rabbit probably has a thymoma. Uh, so what we're seeing here is actually an exophthalmus, uh, bilateral exophthalmus of these guys. Um, and that's due to, uh, in rabbits, that's mostly due to increased uh, pressure from inter intrathoracic masses. So, you know, we're talking about thymic lymphomas, thymomas most of the times for rabbits, but it could be a cyst, like an ingestinal cyst, that it's big enough and compressive enough. Uh, so it is part of a manifestation, I would say, of uh, cranial vena cava syndrome, where, you know, we have all this increased intrathoracic uh, pressure that just compresses the venous outflow or, you know, partially blocks the venous out outflow. Um, and then all the, the venous blood you know, gets backed up and just into this traffic jam uh, with all the veins up, right? Which is your cranio vena cava syndrome. So everything gets congested neck up. Um, and what happens is rabbits have a really well-developed retroorbitus, retroorbital sinus. Um, so we can, you can see all the, you know, the, the really complex anastomosing uh, veins um, and, you know, uh, vein system here. Uh, so whenever we have this backup of, of uh, blood, of venous blood, all these veins will get really engorged, really congested, that will push the eye outward. Uh, and that's your exophthalmus. Usually it is periodic. Um, so, you know, with the, the masses and the movement of the animal, you know, it's a pretty dynamic process. Um, that's usually a presentation. They have this periodical exophthalmus. Uh, it is not both Thomas, so, um, you know, we just had one person answering here, uh, dysplasia of the pectinate ligament, which is, again, a malformation of the filtration angle. That would be your both Thomas. Um, and if it is, you know, predisposed uh, rapid rage, they can certainly have that, uh, but not in this case. Uh, and, you know, usually predisposed weights are, are pretty wide, so this, this guy was, you know, a really cute, you know, white and black rabbit. Um, but it can be difficult sometimes, you know, especially just looking at a picture like this. Uh, there are other tests, you know, the clinic, the clinician can do to help decide. So digital retropulsion, you know, change of position of these animals. If, you know, if you flip the rabbit upside down, uh, the pressure builds up even more. So you have this accentuation um, or augmentation of the exophthalmus, or even you can uh, um, replicate the exophthalmus if it is periodic. Um, and of course, if the intraocular pressure is elevated, that's a sign of actual both thalamus. So uh, pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, think of other prior neoplastic syndromes with thymoma as well. So if it is, of course, a rabbit with crusty lesions, right? Um, always think of a prior neoplastic um, type of syndrome as well. Um, okay, so let's go to our next one. All right. Question number four, uh, this is, well, based on all of my options, you can already know where the tissue is or what type of tissue. Um, so condition, is this a decimidocele, a keratomalacia, indolent ulcer, or corneal sequestrum? Any 
and I'm mostly interested in what is shown by the star. So focus on the asterisk, asterisk or the star. That's what I'm, I'm asking you guys. All right, let's see. Just gonna give a couple more seconds. All right. Oh, nice. We got to a one digit. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we had majority of folks answering Kerato Malaysia, followed by Corner Sequestrum and then Decimetosil. And the last uh, picked option was Indolent Ulcer. So some of you guys are on point. Uh, so this is corneal sequestrum. Um, and this, the keyword here is dog. So, you know, maybe some people would say, oh, wait a second, corneal sequestrum should have that, you know, amber brown discoloration, which is true, uh, but particularly in cats. So it is a really big thing of cats, you know, whatever think of sequestrum, you know, the first poster child comes right into our minds is a, is a cat, but corneal sequestrum can happen in other species, um, just like dogs and horses. Um, and the thing is with this other non-feline species is that the corneal sequestrum is rarely pigmented. They can be, but rarely. Most of the time it's going to be this, uh, you know, this layer of basically devitalized cornea. So there's not going to be any keratocyte viable anymore there. Usually it's just like ghost looking or they're just gone. You just see stacks of hyalinized collagen. They, they had that vitreous, um, you know, appearance to it. Uh, because it's a really desiccated, dense tissue, there is, and there's no, you know, no viability anymore. Nothing gets in and nothing gets out. So inflammation, if it happens, this is what it's going to go. It's, it's just going to stop at the border of where the sequestrum is starting. So no inflammatory cells can get through it. It's basically dead tissue, devitalized tissue. Um, and that's, you know, this whole combo of, of changes. So stacking, lack of viable cells or cell outlines, no inflammation or blood vessels, uh, hyalinization, it's a characteristic of sequestrum. And you can see sequestrum with many different corneal diseases. Uh, you know, we've seen it here in dogs with even uh, fungal diseases. So the rest of the cornea was basically devitalized. Um, and you can have superficial mineral or bacteria just stuck on it and they will not get cleaned up because of all the, you know, lack of leukocyte migration. Eventually, the body will try to extrude or expel that, that tissue. So it's not uncommon to see granulation tissue around those. And then they will be pushed, you know, just like a, a little building block being pushed out. So the rest of the cornea can um, heal again. Um, and uh, yeah, or sometimes, you know, we just see that really break, you know, really nice, sharply demarcated break of that corneal tissue surrounded by granulation tissue. And sometimes, of course, you just have the keratectomy uh, of this expelled tissue by itself, and there's no tissue reaction around it. Um, so that's your corneal sequestrum. Just a heads up that in non-cat species, you can have, you may not see this coloration. So, okay. All right, let's go to our next one. Okay, question number five, canine and nucleation diagnosis. What can you already diagnose based on this picture? Let's see how familiar and good you are with ophthalmic microscopy. So is this a phacoclastic uveitis, phacolytic uveitis, post-traumatic intraocular sarcoma, or a mycotic endophthalmitis? So give me your best guess here. All right, we're still kind of 16, 15 folks is still left. Let's see if we can get some extra folks to reply. All right, we're at 12. This one, there's a lot going on in this picture. It's it's a lot. So it's completely fair if you're a little overwhelmed by this. Okay, so I guess we're stuck at 12. So I'm gonna publish the poll. Um 
all right, again, we had, I know, a decent variation of, of voting here. Uh, majority of folks answered thacroclastic uveitis, followed by mycotic and optomitis, and then just some answering thacolytic, whereas the uh, just a very little, I uh, know, few folks answered uh, post-traumatic trochlear sarcoma. So, majority of you guys got it correct. So, congrats, great deal. Uh, so this is phacoclastic uveitis based on the picture, on the histo, uh, the histo picture. So what we're actually seeing here in this picture is this is the lens capsule. And you know it's a lens capsule because if you're familiar with it, great. Uh, but it is a very thick membrane. It's actually the thickest basal membrane of the body. Um, so this is the lens capsule. Uh, so this is the other end. This lens capsule, well, I guess it's pretty obvious that there is a rupture, right? Or there is a discontinuity of the lens capsule. And then what it was supposed to be, the cortical fibers or lens fibers in general now are just vomited out, right? They're just spilled over onto the chambers and all the business here, the heterogeneous business going on, it's all your inflammatory reaction. Um, you can see a little bit of fraying, fraying of the, uh, the free ends of the lens capsule too, but just seeing the rupture, the blast, right? The blast and the extrusion of lens material and uh, intense inflammation, that's pretty characteristic for a fecoclastic uveitis. Um, uh, just so you guys know, this is part of the iris. This is a posterior pigmented epithelium. This iris is very inflamed. There's a lot of exudate. There's a lot going on here. So this eye is pretty, pretty inflamed. Uh, and phacoclastic uveitis, which is this case that I just showed you guys, um, it is part of the umbrella of lens-induced uveitis. So clinicians mostly use lens-induced uveitis. Um, it is uh, also fairly common condition in dogs. And there are two big categories of presentations. So if you is induced by lens can be phacolytic, where you have usually a cataract um, of this lens that will lead to di diffusion of soluble lens proteins that will slowly overwhelm the immune tolerance of that eye and that will uh, lead to a very low grade inflammation, usually a very chronic, mild lymphoplasmacytic uh, anterior uveitis. Whereas the phacoclastic, though, so I usually use here with our residents, think of phacolytic leakage, uh, you know, just kind of rhyming there. So leakage through the intact capsule leading to this low grade inflammation. Whereas phacoclastic, that's your blast where everything will be a mess and a chaos. So you have a rupture of lens capsule, this sudden release of uh, antigenic lens uh, proteins into the eye and the eye just gets really overwhelmed and just panicked. Uh, and you have all this robust inflammation going on there. Uh, so this picture shows all the, the little thingies here. So we see these are almost like looking like plaques that are different from the asteroid hyalosis that were dots. Uh, so these little plaques are actually plastered against the coronoendothelium, which is the inner surface, and these are keratic precipitates. Um, those are just, you know, leukocytes plastered against the uh, coronoendothelium, and that's uh, one of the hallmarks of uveitis. This is a mentorschnauzer; they are predisposed, you know, to uh, to many uh, narconopathies. But this uh, dog had diabetes that had. Uh, diabetic cataract, where the intumescence sense cataracts just suddenly rupture and causes really intense uveitis. Just, so this is, um, uh, you know, kind of a chart to help differentiate that I also share with our residents. So if you're, if you want to, you know, go back and kind of remind yourself what phacolytic versus phacoclastic means. So phacolytic means, you know, remember of your, of your leakage and phacoclastic, think of a blast. Um, and this is all the, the differences. Because fecal classic is associated with rupture, you're going to see, uh, you know, capsule, capsule coiling most of the times or, you know, inflammation inside of the lenticular material um, or just, you know, the fraying of the, you know, ragged capsular, um, capsular material being, you know, just eaten up by neutrophils. So that's your difference. So we saw fecal classic. So good job, guys. All right, next one. Okay, uh, canine eyelid nodule. These are characteristic for mycobacteria, meibomian gland product, necrotic adipocytes, 
or dystrophic mineralization. So let's see. All right, we still have 17 folks. Let's see, some people are probably kind of figure out what's going on in this picture. I'm gonna tell you guys, this is a polarized slide or a picture of a polarized slide, which is very useful for, you know, island nodules. Okay, I think we have some, a little bit of, um, probably a little bit of a, you know, kind of question, like what's going on here. So maybe people are not as um, confident on this. So let's go ahead and publish it. Um, all right. Well, majority of you folks answered right. So this is actually consistent with or characteristic for the Bowman gland product. Uh, some of you guys for some of you guys answer dystrophic mineralization. Uh, so but majority got it right. Uh, so hopefully you guys are familiar or assume you guys are familiar then with the polarization of the Bowman gland product. Uh, so what we're seeing here is a pretty higher magnification of this island nodule. These are, you know, probably free lipid that are now just, you know, ruptured and being encased or embraced by the granulomatous inflammation. So all these guys are epithelioid macrophages. You know, there's some multinucleated giant cells here, uh, and they're chock full of these needle-like, very delicate needle-like um, uh, birefringent crystals. So this is a characteristic of a byproduct of mebum, and mebum helps, you know, the, the, its secretion um, will help with the the lipid layer of the, or will be the component of the lipid layer of the precorneal tear film. Um, it is a, a fairly complex, you know, kind of chemical composition. Uh, I just want to tell you guys, it is different from sebum, and that's a characteristic for those crystalloid, you know, acicular looking structures inside of the cytoplasm. Um, I'm not going to read all the chemicals that are in there, the lipidic products, but they they are known to have a higher molecular weight and a decreased polarity, than, uh, which is different from sebum. And that will help, you know, being uh, like a liquid, um, they're actually a li liquidic or in a fluid phase whenever they're secreted. And then later on, they will, they will act with their actual lipid properties. Uh, and interesting enough, amoebum of dogs have a very similar lipidome as humans. Uh, so, you know, there can be some comparisons there, uh, especially, you know, diseases that affect the amoebomian glands. Um, and this is a transmission electron microscopy showing, you know, how those crystalloid structures will look like on a, a little bit higher mag. So this is the nucleus of that cell. And all of these guys are that linear, uh, linear components, which is you know, supposed to be complex, you know, phospholipids, rests of um, membrane and, and, you know, just lipidic, special lipidic, oh, sorry, special lipidic content. Uh, the polarization does not happen in sebaceous glands, uh, sebaceous gland no rupture and tumors. So we can see these polarized structures in uh, mebomian gland adenomas that rupture, uh, epitheliomas that have a little bit more mebum secretion with it. Uh, or the regular, you know, chalazians or lacrogranulomatous uh, blepharitis that is just solitary rupture of those glands. So if you polarize it, you know you are uh, in the mebomian gland category. Okay, let's go to our next one. Oh, sorry, start full. Okay, so young cat, histopathology. Based on this clinical picture, what, what do you think we're going to see? So degranulated eosinophils, sheets of lymphocytes, keratin pearls, or a cellular hyaline cornea. All right, let's see. I'm gonna eat some seconds.
Okay, this is an interesting one. We have so far, I'm not sure if you guys can see the, the poll real time, but from here you can see, and it's a, a pretty balanced, um, fairly balanced voting. Okay, I'm just gonna publish it. All right, so those are the results. Um, you know, basically a third uh, evenly distributed throughout, you know, A through C. So, you know, people are not sure if it degranulated EOs, she cell lymphocytes, or carrying tuberculosis. Just just go o going over the the options here, the foils and the, the possible answers. So, degranulated eosinophils, I think, is very you know kind of characteristic. You'd expect just degranulated eosinophils from a uh, eosinophilic rich inflammation or inflammatory condition. Uh, sheets of lymphocytes that you know it's a foil, probably indicating lymphoma. Uh, keratin proles is the characteristic you know expression or phrase we use for uh, squamous cell carcinoma. And then the acellular hyaline cornea, uh, that should already be, you know, kind of linked with the corneal sequestrum we just talked about, uh, which in cats already mentioned is usually pigmented and amber, you know, brown color. Uh, just amber brown, sorry. Uh, so these guys are actually uh, degranulating eosinophils histologically, or, you know, they can have degranulating eosinophils based on all the options here. This is the best option. So this is very characteristic clinically. It's very characteristic for eosinophilic or you know proliferative uh, eosinophilic keratitis or keratoconjunctivitis. conjunctivitis. It is a thing of cats, horses, and rabbits. Um, you know we're mostly used to hearing them in cats, but horses also a fairly uh, commonly affected species. Uh, unfortunately, the stimulus is not known. There is a lot of you know speculation and investigation of infectious agents, you know herpes viruses, you know you name it, um, causing or associated slash causation with this condition. But it is believed to be a hypersensitivity reaction, of course, because of the eosinophil. So you're going to blame it on the hypersensitivity always. Um, and they do have this more proliferative or placoid white material. It can be a little yellowish as well. Um, but this placoid appearance or thickening or opacity of the cornea is very characteristic of the condition and they can affect the cornea uh, entirely like this you know these are probably extra uh, bits of inflammation but this whole cornea is diffusely affected by this uh, process um i know yeah why i think it's um I think there's a lot of corner reaction here as well, but I'm not sure if this cat had another uh, irritable uh, pathology. Um, they just mentioned the eosinophilic keratitis on this case. So that's a great question, Jane. So, you know, maybe we're thinking of, uh, we're gonna talk about, you know, the, the another condition that can affect iris of cats, but, you know, maybe it has some other uveitis or even your plastic condition. But. Nothing there, at least not that they reported. Um, so the thing is with these, they are rarely submitted for histopathology because it's so characteristic clinically that you know they just diagnose it and treat it. Um, but if they ever happen to be sampled, usually is between cytology, histology, cytologists prefer. So you know they do cytology um, of those. You see epithelial cells, a couple of mast cells, eos and granules. If you see a couple of eos and fellows, it's already pretty diagnostic. Um, and histopath, it's when it gets to the point of being, you know, sampled for bi for biopsy, it is a already on the chronic stage. So uh, if you see EOs, you're pretty lucky. You're going to see probably a couple here and there, but don't expect to be a xenophilic rich histology sample. Uh, you're probably going to see more of a chronic mixed, you know, uh, uh, mononuclear inflammation. Uh, yeah, young cats are more uh, more frequently affected by this. Yeah. Uh, compared to older animals. But again, never say never, uh, you know, age-wise, you can expect anything, but usually younger animals. Uh, especially, you know, because of this possible association with herpes, so they, they usually present it a little bit earlier in life. Um, and then you can see a little bit of granulation tissue, you know, ulcers. Uh, the, the very, you know, big hallmark of the condition are the byproducts of the eosinophilic uh, you know, enzymes, granules, et cetera. So they just form these plaques of degranulating, 
you know, shmoo uh, that are just amorphous and again, granular on top of the ulcerated cornea. So if you see this, slam dunk the condition, but again, don't expect to see this all the time, especially if, histo, if you ever get a histo of this, because again, these are super uh, straightforward clinically. Um, all right. Oh, okay. I guess this is my favorite. I was just kidding. This is my favorite. Okay. Start poll. All right. So, Crescent Gecko, name the condition. Is this Bufthalmus, pseudobufthalmus, corneal lipidosis, or spetacolitis? Let's see. Okay, let's see if uh, four more people can answer. Okay, two, one. Just one more. Okay, great. All right, publish poll. Ooh, nice. You guys are on point with BioLife uh, ophthalmology, ophthalmopathology. Great. Yes, this is uh, pseudobufthalmus. Um, if you've never heard of pseudobufthalmus before, don't freak out. Um, it is a thing of, you know, this, uh, this type of animal. So, um, and it, because it is related to the spectacle and, you know, its association, its spaces. Uh, so actually just from facts, this is um, a pretty young juvenile uh, gecko uh, and it's thought to be a congenital case in this, in this particular image. Uh, but one other thing that is pretty obvious is how clear it is. So, you know, given all the options, spetaculitis would be, again, inflammatory. So it should be more exudative, right? Opaque with all the inflammatory cells and it's exudate byproducts. Uh, so probably not inflammation. Lipidosis would probably, would, would have more opacity and deposits um, in within or, um, you know, under the, the cornea. Uh, and both towers would be the whole eye would be, right, really, uh, really big. So in this case, what is happening here is an expansion of the uh, subspetacular space. So if you're not familiar with this condition, it's also called bolus, I'll try to say this uh, commonly, spectac spectaculopathy. Uh, it's pretty hard to say this fast. So the Uh But what happens is um, if you're familiar with how you know the whole physiology of these guys are, so they do have um, you know, glands that communicate with the base or the, the ventral portion of the subspetacular space. So the subspetacular space, it contains this, what is, you know, equivalent to the, to the lacrimal fluid. Um, and these animals have a very tortuous um, kind of outflow or just tortuous, you know, pipeline, I would say, uh, that would dump into the oral cavity. And if you have any obstruction or malformation of those ductal, ductal systems, uh, you can have just backup and accumulation of uh, the lacrimal secretions in there. So that's why, you know, you just have this increased buildup of, of a fluid in the space that is immediately underneath the spectacle and um, on top of the cornea. So it's just this the actual space or subspetacular space or spectacular cor corneal space. Uh, so if you have, you know, obstruction uh, from inflammation, like a stomatitis or even infectious agents that are ascending from there, uh, neoplasms in that area or hypervitaminosis A, where it causes hyperkeratosis of ducts in general, it can also block and cause this traffic jam um, with an accumulation of lacrimal fluids. Uh, it can also be congenital, just like the, the picture I just showed. Uh, which is a pretty juvenile animal. And if it is congenital, it's a poor prognosis because again, it's, you know, there's nothing you can, there, not nothing. Uh, there are some procedures that are uh, pretty elite procedures that can be done to try to create another, you know, kind of pipeline, alternative pipeline from there. But, you know, if it's something that you can treat versus something that you, you need to create something else or, you know, reconstruct the ductal system, um, you know, it carries a poor prognosis than the infectious route. Um, and usually it is clear, 
if it, there's accumulation of those lacrimal secretions, but if it just stays there for a while, or if it is something ascending from the mouth, it can, of course, be predisposed or, pre you know, just serve as a environment for bacterial overgrowth and bacterial migration, and then just inflammation from there. Um, so it can become turbid and lead to spectaculitis um, eventually. And uh, you can find Eddie, the Crassy Gecko on Facebook. Um, he had, I'm not sure what Eddie's situation is right now, but he had bilateral birth traumas. I guess it was from an infection. I'm not, I cannot remember uh, quite well what was the, the culprit. Uh, but you can see that the whole spectacle is bulging where, with this accumulation of fluid underneath it, but it's pretty cute. Uh, no, the condition, so we have a question here in the chat that asking if this condition is always bilateral. No, it depends on the cause and the process. Um, it can definitely be unilateral, uh, especially you now if you have just a like malformation, congenital malformation. Um, yes, so uh, I have another question. Can the spectacle be lensed to allow drainage? Yes, especially the congenital cases, uh, they will need uh, this, um, you know, aspiration uh, constantly on a regular basis, which can be also tricky, right? Whoever is, owns those animals. So that's why also always cares uh, a poor prognosis because it needs constant lancing and drainage. But yes, you can do that. And usually it's a pretty clear fluid if it's not contaminated and nothing will grow on um, ancillary testing. So uh, there is a really cool uh, recent review, 2023, of these um you know anatomy related to spectacle and these uh gland ducts in on the literature um i'm gonna see if i can I'll, I'll find it or if somebody already finds it and posts in the chat please do it uh, it's pretty pretty neat um and actually there's pictures from there so actually yeah you guys can see <laughs> the authors uh from here uh if you find it in 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 the scholar from that place post it here i highly recommend it. it's pretty cool pretty awesome paper and they also cover a little bit of treatment with these guys. All right, we're almost there. Um, let's go to question number nine. Um, feline uveal mass, most likely diagnosis. Let's see. All right, I still have 30 folks. Okay, now the numbers are getting low again. All right, I can see already a trend going on uh, with this. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and publish it. Okay, we have other. Uh, okay, great. So one person already posted. Awesome, thank you so much, appreciate it. Uh, okay, so we had a trend. Uh, perfect. Yes, you guys got it. So diffuse iris melanoma. Uh, so the big thing here with this histopath, I already gave you guys a location, right? It is a uveal mass. So in the uvea, you don't know where the uvea is, but if, if you are familiar with the conditions, probably iris. Um, but, you know, it's pretty anaplastic looking or, you know, this large, gigantic cell. Um, so recently I came across... Uh, it was a first for me, but I came across mononuclear gigantism. I don't love that. Uh, it kind of fits with this. Uh, but yeah, pretty, pretty marked anisocariosis, you know, really bad looking cells. Uh, if you're not familiar with the condition, you know, honestly, any anaplastic neoplasia is pretty fair game. Uh, but if you start to see, of course, you know, you, one would be like, oh, are these pre-existing uveal melanocytes that are just spread apart from, by the neoplastic cells, or are these actual neoplastic cells rarely having, right, this cytoplasmic pigmentation? And I think this is, this nucleus is pretty, you know, round for just a melanocyte of the cat uvea. So I think this is a neoplastic cell, true neoplastic cell. It does have um, this, you know, few melanin looking content. Uh, but this is characteristic of feline diffuse iris melanoma that can have multiple histological patterns uh, or morphology. So you can have, you know, the classic round polygonal spindle, mix and match. You can have the balloon or anaplastic. I think this is more towards like anaplastic feature. 
uh, or you know, giant cell in a plastic, et cetera. Um, it is the most common primary ocular tumor in cats or ocular neoplasms of cats. Um, it has a variable progression. It, they can actually remain static once they develop, you know, they usually start as a melanosis, which is by default, you know, by convention, the name gave, uh, given to just proliferation of melanocytes on top of the iris or the dysplastic melanocytes on top of the iris. Uh, once they start to colonize the actual stroma, that's when they are called the iris melanoma. Uh, so they can start as melanosis and just remain static, or they can just progress to progressively into early melanoma, right? Just early invasive and then full on, you know, blown out melanoma of the eye. Um, usually that I think if, if you have clinicians, you're folks more onto updated clinics. Um, I think they go for more, um, you know, just having, a uh, Accompanying these cases, if it, uh, the big red flags are rapid progression. So if you have a rapid, you know, expansion and colonization of the iris, that's a really red flag. These animals should definitely be, all of these animals should be being, you know, constantly being screened for, you know, all the um, ophthalmic sanation. But if it is rapid, that's a, a big deal. Um, it is a, a, one of the most common causes for glaucoma in cats, the other being the chronic uveitis. You know, just on a specific lymphoblastomocytic uveitis, but this should always be in your radar for catanucleations. Um, and if it is an aplastic, you know, one can figure out, oh, maybe it's uh, an aplastic lymphoma or some sort of weird carcinoma. So you can do immunohistochemistries to help you, but if you're familiar with the condition and you're comfortable, you know, recognizing the anaplastic cells, a couple of pigments here and there, um, that should be your diagnosis straight away. Um, unfortunately, they do carry risk if, a risk for metastasis, usually it's to the liver, but they can be in other organs as well. Uh, but yeah, they can, especially the metastatic cases are usually taken over when the eye is completely taken over by uh, neoplasia. Um, so the top picture is showing just a couple of spots. These were both diagnosed as uh, iris melanoma. These are just coalescent, whereas this one is uh, already spread out um, and diffuse. So. They can have different uh, clinical variations and, uh, you know, iris biopsy is a thing, it's an option. Uh, there are some limitations, but some people do it and some people get a diagnosis of melanoma with it. The only caveat is melanosis because if you just get a partial thickness iris biopsy, uh, you may just get, you know, just a superficial melanocytes and you're not able to appreciate the presence or lack of invasion. So um, there's a limitation of, over there. Um, all right. Oh yeah, okay, so this is how they uh, they look like, you know, this is a pretty a melanotic, uh, I would say poorly pigmented slash melanotic version of it, uh, which looks pretty white. So lymphoma is also, you know, like fair game. Um, so histopathology would, would do the trick here. Okay, so now we are in the potpourri. Let's see if you guys got it, um, phase of the presentation. So uh, let me start a poll. Okay, so this dog came with uh, perforation. This is from our routine. Uh, actually, this dog had a really bad keratomalacia to begin with, et cetera. So it led to perforation. Um, it was a mess, this eye, but on the very, very rostral part of this eye, I saw these. So what is actually being expelled at this point here? What do you guys think? Oh, sorry. Ah, there's no poll. Of course, there's a poll for this. Uh, you can just, this one, it's let's open the chat. Um, so this is more like open question type of thing. Uh, what do you guys think is being expelled over here? Let's do a, like a chat burst, as Dr. Imai likes to say too. <laughs> Asteroid spook. <laughs> Beatrice. Okay, Carlage question mark. Okay, the right image shows asteroid hello, so so feature material. Mentorites, I like that. Yes. Beautiful. The snowflakes of the eye. Um okay, we have some people, we have some decent turnaround here in the chat. Uh great. I think not having the maybe we should check with Mike if there is a uh, like a anonymous anonymous version of a chat, maybe people will be less timid to put an answer if it is anonymous. Um, great. So 
We do have a lot of people got it. So this is vitreous. It is a sign. So this, oh, I hear it. So this dog had the generation of the vitreous. Um, it was probably age related. And now it's being expelled, right? Extruded from the defect. Um, oh, it's, I guess expelled because more of like a passive, you know, type of thing. Uh, but at lands is lands is gone. You know, part of the iris is gone. It's just a mess. Uh, but yeah, this is vitreous. So vitreous is just out of here. Um, okay, so so uh, we have a question. In the first case, was anterior displacement of the vitreous uh, cause increased? IOP. Uh, so that's a great question. That would be more, I mean, they would need to, of course, evaluate this dog clinically, but they can. They can. If vitreous gets displaced onto the anterior chamber, they can just push the iris back uh, or cause angle distortion. So it can definitely be, um, be a cause of, of increased IOP. But without the clinical information, it would be tough to say. Um, okay, so yes, vitreous content among others. So yes. All right, and then last one. Let's see what you guys think here. Dog, this animal may develop, actually, it already has a little bit that you guys can see on the picture, but focus on the center of the picture only. So this animal may develop blank uveitis. So let's do a chat burst. Let's see if we can get, let's see if we have anybody that thinks differently. Or not really. Okay, so far I'm seeing a lot of apoplastic uveitis. Okay, I saw the people typing, then they gave up on typing. Go for it, go for it. Many people are just stopping typing. Okay, I'll just give one more second for those that are putting their thoughts together. Okay, we have a question here. Okay, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, well, but, uh, you know, apart from the question that we, we had, we had a pretty decent trend of ecoclastic. So yes, you guys got this right. Um, so what is, yeah, Swiss roll, I love that. Yeah, cinema roll, Swiss roll, I love that. In Portuguese, we have, uh, I mean, in Brazil, uh, uh, we have a word, uh, hocambole. Hocambole is like almost like our Brazilian Swiss roll version. So, um, yeah, so it's pretty coiled. We know there is a lens capsule rupture. These are all cataractors changes as well. So this animal had bladder cell formation, you know, morganin can be secondary primary. Uh, but this animal had most important here, lens capsule rupture that predisposes for a really robust, right, blast, uh, robust, overwhelming uh, inflammation of this eye, which is a fecoclastic, usually fibrinolomatous or suppurative, depending on the animal, et cetera. Um, so we have a question of, can you start with fecolytic and lead to fecoclastic? Yes, most of the cases actually that already started with a cataract, um, you know, I guess, or nucleation period with inflammation, they already have a low grade chronic uveitis to begin with, uh, which is, you know, because the cataract is, you know, kind of chicken or the egg type of situation. But yeah, if the animal, you know, has um, uh, already a cataract going on, this animal already had a low grade uveitis, and maybe this animal was, I don't know, like uh, hit by a car, I don't know, something on that route. Uh, hit by a car is usually more like proptosis type of thing, but let's say the capsule just ruptures, um, you can then have a thicker classic on top of it, so. Um, so yeah. Um, okay. I think, yeah, that's, that's all I have for y'all. So we are, you know, finishing a little bit under an hour.